Thanks for joining us on Earnings Plus. I'm Chris Bianchi. For the first week of the month of July, the Earth set a new temperature, global temperature record, with an average temperature on July the 6th of 63 degrees Fahrenheit, or about 17.23 degrees Celsius. That made it the warmest day ever recorded on Earth, according to the National Centers for Environmental Protection. And in some cases, there are some uh, climatologists that are saying that it was the warmest day in perhaps over 100,000 years. So for a bit more context on this truly astonishing record, what it means and how it's measured, and also what it might mean for us even here in Colorado, we're now joined by Scott Denning, a climate scientist and a professor and atmospheric scientist at Colorado State University. Uh, Scott, thanks for taking the time to join us today and lend us a bit of context about this uh, astonishing record. Thanks for uh, having me. Yeah, Scott, so I I guess before we get into this, and I don't mean to sound skeptical, I kinda wanna uh, get some of the science behind this. And it's got to be, at least in my mind, a bit challenging to accurately assess the Earth's average global temperature. So um, would you mind lending us a bit more about uh, how this is exactly done, how much faith you also have that the numbers behind this are accurate? Sure. Well, uh, you're absolutely right. I mean, it's it, not, not only is it hard to know what the Earth's average temperature is, um, it's hard to even understand what that means, right? So somewhere right now, um, it's 50 below, it's uh, Antarctic winter, the wind's blowing 100 miles an hour, you're glad you're not there, right? So, so uh, it's not like the whole world is 63 degrees Fahrenheit, that, that's crazy. The, there's uh, all this variation from place to place, from you know, hour to hour, from day to day. So um, as you know, um, the, the weather service and uh, weather services in all the different countries bring the uh, thermometers, you know, thousands and thousands of thermometers, uh, buoys at sea, satellites, airplanes that send telemetry, all that kind of stuff um, into a big analysis system every six hours, uh, re- really 24-7 for decades, uh, into this big system that is then used to predict the weather, right? So our, our uh, w- weather prediction for this afternoon um, depends on knowing what the conditions are right now at the beginning of the forecast. And that's really the source of these data is that they, they come in from all over the world every six hours. Uh, they're sort of uh, mushed together into this giant uh, database in, in computer systems, uh, not just in the U.S., but, you know, there's like a dozen of these forecast centers around the world that do this. And that's the source of the data uh, that, that shows these little wiggles. And um, for context, yeah, I mean, we've been doing this for, um, for decades. And you can sort of watch the little wiggly line uh, day after day, week after week, decade after decade. Um, and it mostly follows kind of a, you know, seasonal cycle. It's cold in the winter, it's warm in the summer and so forth. Uh, but year after year, those, those numbers have been marching upward with global warming. And uh, this past month or so, they've sort of jumped even higher than, than they had been before. That, that's the context. And so the exact temperature last Thursday, July the 6th, 63.01 degrees. That was the average temperature globally. Uh, I know that includes, Scott, to what you were just saying a second ago, uh, land masses, uh, sea surface temperatures as well. Uh, Could you put into perspective how high that is compared to the long-term averages as well as what it might mean for us globally? So so, uh, really, probably, um, even though this is a spectacular number, I I would not get too wrapped around the axle about uh, the, the global average temperature down to the tenths of a degree Fahrenheit. Uh, the, the average temperature of the world is about two degrees Fahrenheit warmer than it was when I was a kid uh, or when you were a kid, right? So, so like, let's say 50 years ago, uh, the global average temperature was a couple of degrees Fahrenheit lower than it is now. And that's global warming, right? That's the sort of steady march of temperature up, 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 up. Uh, On the other hand, for this time of year, which is the warmest time of year on Earth, because it's, you know, summertime in the Northern Hemisphere is where all the land is. That's where the the summers are hot. Um, This is the warmest time of year. And the temperature last week that hit this record was about a half a degree Fahrenheit hotter 
than it has, or no, almost a whole degree Fahrenheit, I'm sorry, half a degree Celsius, a whole degree Fahrenheit hotter than, let's say, the average over the last 20 years. So it's, it's a pretty substantial jump. I mean, um, let me give you another sort of context thing here. The difference between uh, the, the bitter cold of January when all of Siberia is frozen and uh, the middle of July when Siberia is roasting is about three degrees Celsius, maybe three and a half degrees Celsius. And so we're looking at uh, a half degree Celsius above that. Yeah, that's pretty pretty substantial, right? That's like 20% of the difference between winter and summer. That's it's a pretty big difference. That is a pretty big difference, no doubt about that. Um, with, without sim oversimplifying this, is it, you, you mentioned this at the beginning, um, is this, caused by global warming or is it hard to maybe pin down one specific day one specific record to yeah. the warming climate so 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 great question um i i gotta have to uh i'm not dodging your question i'm gonna try try to make it clearer for you uh it's in the nature of averages okay so so let's imagine that instead of uh, global temperatures we're talking about um Baseball, we're, we're talking about uh, somebody's batting average, right? And so uh, you got some guy who, um, you know, used to hit 250 and all of a sudden this summer he's hitting 350. He's, he's, he's just knocking him out of the park. And um, we, we say his batting average has gone up. Now, on the other hand, like, let's say it's Wednesday afternoon at uh, Coors Field and this guy comes up to the plate and, um, you know, uh, the pitcher is tired. Uh, maybe he didn't sleep at, uh, you know, a good hotel last night. Uh, there's a gust of wind that, that blows it uh, right into the strike zone uh, at the just an opportune moment. And whack, you know, out over the over the wall. It's just like out of here. Um, so you can't necessarily it would be crazy to say that particular home run is because his batting average went up. Yeah, you know that that's kind of what you're asking is what are these high temperatures today because the average has gone up no it's the other way around his batting average is up because he's hitting a bunch of home runs right the the, the cause and effect here is almost backwards um, you'd have to say that uh, the temperatures are going up and, and that's why the averages are high right so it's the hot weather that makes the averages go up rather than the other way around um, now, to take that analogy a little farther, um, geez, this guy used to hit 250 and now he's hitting 350 or 400. Guess what? It's because he's on steroids, right? So, so that particular pitch uh, was in, a, in, in the sweet spot and he knocked it out of the park. But the fact that he's doing it much more than he used to, that's not a particular pitch. That's the steroids, right? So, so the analogy with global warming is that we're having all these hot temperatures because of all this CO2 in the atmosphere. And that's driving the averages up. So I, I think maybe the way to think of it is in terms of like cause and effect is we set coal, oil and gas on fire. That adds to the CO2 in the atmosphere and holds heat into the earth. That makes it hot. And therefore the averages are going up over time. Does that make more sense? Yeah, no, that's a really good analogy. And I guess can we, based off of that, expect more of these extremes in the future? And also, uh, for context, you mentioned how 50 years ago, you said that we were about two degrees cooler. Um, with these new records that are being set, and with the increase of global warming, it, has this exceeded or is this about what the previous expectations were with global warming? And what sort of, uh, what, what might this tell us about the future? Yeah, so uh, unfortunately, the news there is, is kind of grim. Uh, the, the march of temperatures up and up and up has pretty much followed exactly what physicists said 50 years ago was going to happen if we keep burning all this coal, oil, and gas. Um, and so, yeah, the more we burn, uh, the hotter it will get. And this is like a permanent thing. It's not like uh, the brown cloud in Denver where if you don't drive on Saturday, the brown cloud dissipates. No, the CO2 is kind of forever. Um, so every lump of coal that ever gets burned raises the Earth's temperature by some little bit, and it doesn't go back down. So 
it, it accumulates over time and gets hotter and hotter and hotter. And that means, yeah, more heat waves, more floods, more heavy storms and all that kind of stuff. Um, at some point, we are going to decide to stop making it worse uh, by switching out the coal, oil and gas for solar and wind and batteries and transmission lines and hydro and all that other kind of stuff. Um, and then it'll stop getting hotter. Um, I guess, Scott, I kind of want to also localize this a little bit here in Colorado. Sure. Um, it's worth noting and uh, that we've obviously had a cool, wet spring, early start to summer, in some cases near record amounts of precipitation. Uh, we certainly haven't felt a warm spring summer. I know the, the rest of the country has. Um, can you contextual, contextualize that? Uh, obviously, sure. as a meteorologist, I, I kind of know this, but uh, uh, for our viewers yeah. out there. Well, so, so I mean, it's a big world. And the, the, this is, again, this is like part of the uh, idea of averages. Um, we, we happen to be in a place where the, the heat wasn't, you know, during the month of June. We, we, it's, it's actually pretty hot out today, uh, but it was cold a week ago, two weeks ago. So the hot and the cold move around on the earth. Um, and that's our sort of day to day, week to week weather. Uh, but it's, it's the whole earth that's gotten hotter. So the amount of the hot places exceeds the amount of the cold places uh, when you take the global average. You can sort of reshuffle it. That's the winds blowing the heat around from day to day, the cold fronts, the warm fronts, the um, different kinds of, uh, of extremes. Um, but the point of the, the batting average, if you will, uh, is that there's this kind of inexorable march upward and ditto for the global temperatures. It's even though it's cool here or was cool here a month ago, the world as a whole is super hot. Um, you know, you, 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 you look out the window and it's hard to know what the global <laughs> average temperature is. That's, that's why it's hard, right? That's why we have uh, global observing system and satellites and, uh, and computers and all that. So if these averages continue to increase, what can we expect here in Colorado in the future? Let's say we get back into a warm spell. Do we have the potential for another 2012 like summer or perhaps something even worse in the coming years? Yeah, I mean, yes, we do. Uh, or 2020 was another one, right? That, um, so uh, unfortunately, you know, we've had about the globe as a whole has warmed up about two degrees Fahrenheit. Uh, if, if we don't stop burning fossil fuels, but by the end of the century, uh, it, it won't be two degrees Fahrenheit. It, in this part of the world, it might be more like eight or 10 degrees Fahrenheit. That's the difference in temperature between Denver and uh, Estes Park. So imagine the temperatures of Denver, you know, going up to Estes Park or the temperatures of Estes Park going up to Trail Ridge Road. That, that's really huge. Uh, Denver temperatures being what Albuquerque temperatures are uh, nowadays. We, we don't want to do that. We, we don't want uh, a, a future in which um, the climate that we're used to, that our farmers are used to, that our forests are used to, that our water supply is used to, we don't want that climate to, to change to Albuquerque. Um, we have to stop setting carbon on fire so that we can avoid just cranking the global thermostat uh, another six or eight or 10 degrees. That, that's just crazy. We don't want to do that. Absolutely. Uh, Scott, anything else about this record that was set last week in the broader context uh, for all Yeah, that? well, the, the records are going to come and go, uh, but it's the trend that, that's, our, that's our problem, right? So, yeah, you know, super hot right now. Um, it's going to cool off. I, you know, this is the nature of extremes. Um, but, but the real point is that we have to figure out a different way to keep our cities lit, uh, drive our cars, make our stuff, uh, run the internet. All, all of that stuff's got to got to be powered without burning carbon that then cranks the thermostat of the world to a higher and higher state. And certainly getting that lesson, uh, I suppose, that harsh way over the course of the last few days with an extremely, extremely hot uh, starts of July globally. But uh, Scott Denning, a professor of atmospheric science at Colorado State University and a climate scientist, uh, thanks so much for taking the time to join us today and lend us some of your expertise and context uh, about this global temperature record. Thank you. Thank you for having me.